salutations respective viewers. I'm George from Ireland, so giving a bit of a tour of Edinburgh Castle, which is on a um, dormant volcano on Edinburgh Rock. And there's been some sort of a fortification here for 3,000 years. There's been only something that we would call a castle for about a thousand. And there's some Roman artifacts here from around 2,000 years ago. Of course, the Romans came to um, Britannia in, I'm just trying to think, when, when was it? 54 AD? Um, to stay permanently, obviously Julius Caesar at 44, oh god, I can't remember what it was, Julius Caesar, some years before he died, about 10 years before he died, he invaded the southern bit of Britannia, um, we now just call that southern England, and didn't get very far, two successive campaigning seasons coming over from Gaul. But only over 100 years later did the Romans um, venture here. Of course, there's no concept of Scotland or England or Britain at the time, just the, the Greeks had named Ireland and Great Britain Britannicae, as in the Tin Islands. So there are many different um, tribes here, Caledonian tribes here, constantly fighting against each other. They had no form of writing, so we don't know very much about them. It's all second-hand, it's all what the Romans tell us. Um, anyway, uh, so the first um, mention of Edinburgh is in E. Gododin, this um, uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, epic poem about people here at Din Eden, or Edinburgh, um, uh, 300 warriors who supposedly drunk themselves silly and then rode off into battle and properly all got slaughtered. They were trying to psych themselves up. Might not have been wise to drink so heavily before they're going to fight because you need a bit of hand-eye coordination, a bit of Dutch courage. Okay, so. Um, there was no clear distinction between Scotland and England. People didn't have a concept of these. People we were Anglo-Saxons are here, and they, the, the Anglo-Saxons, they completely blended the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, but then they divided themselves into kingdoms, and Northumbria was one, sometimes as part of Northumbria. So the old name for Edinburgh, Dunedin, was later used, used, in, used in New Zealand. There's a city in South Island, in New Zealand, called Dunedin, as in an honor of this city where I'm standing now. Um, but anyway, so by the Middle Ages, um, Edinburgh Castle obviously existed, and Edinburgh wasn't the first capital of Scotland. Originally, it was Dunfermline, which is about 25 miles that way, north of the Firth of Forth, the other side of the water, in Fife, and there's Dunfermline Abbey. And um, later they shifted the capital here. It seemed crazy to me, as England was their, was their traditional foe, to move the capital closer to the enemy. But anyway, they did it. So um, uh, the King of Scots, he summoned Parliament wherever he, he wanted them to meet him. And sometimes he brought them here to, to um, uh, Edinburgh Castle. Um, uh, David I, for instance, did so. And so uh, there, there were the three estates. There, was, there were the... Um, uh, Episcopate, how do you say Episcopacy, something like that, the bishops, the archbishops, and then there was the nobility, and um, lastly, there were representatives of the, these royal boroughs. If you were a village group big enough to be a town, you might get a charter from the king saying, yes, you are, you are a borough now, and there you can elect a mayor, a provost, they say in Scotland, just your leading citizens, the men of property can do so, and you can send somebody here to Parliament when I choose to summon one, might be allow you to hold markets and build a town wall and things like that. Obviously allowing them to build a town wall would give them a degree of autonomy, keep thieves out, but also um, if they rebelled against the king, it'd be more difficult to take it by storm. Um, anyway, especially before, when was it? We, did, we didn't get artillery in this part of the world to the 13th century. Didn't get, you know, gunpowder from the Chinese, obviously they're using it for fireworks, but we turned it to military purposes in Europe. Um, anyway, I won't, I won't give you a potted history of North Britain, but uh, the maid of Norway died, this six-year-old girl who'd sailed over, she fell ill and was taken ashore at, uh, at, um, at uh, when was it, um, at, at, at the Orkney Isles in, I think it's 1296, because she was the granddaughter of the King of Scots. The granddaughter had accidentally ridden his horse off a cliff, and his granddaughter was his closest surviving relative, so she was meant to be Queen of Scots, but she died very young. And so who was going to be the next King of Scots? They had to decide. And so there were several, there were many different claimants. It wasn't strictly primogenitor. Anyway, so they couldn't decide amongst themselves. They asked um, King Edward I, who was uh, King of England, to decide. And he picked um, John um, Balliol, or John Balliol, some people pronounce it. And the tomb tabard of the empty coat, as he's known by some, because they said that really he was um, just um, a marionette of the English. Um, but he, he wasn't um, subservient enough, so soon he's pushed out and later, um, Edward I said, I tell you what, I'll, 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 I'll choose the next King of Scots. I choose me. Um, but he did have some sort of claim to it, as I think his great grandmother had been a Scots um, princess. So Edward I, oh, long shanks, as in long legs, they called him, was a very tall man, was King of Scotland and indeed King of England. But many people in Scotland didn't accept that. So um, William Wallace, you may have seen the film Braveheart, rebelling against him, um, ultimately unsuccessful. He was, he, was, he was captured, made to walk all the way to London, and then hanged, drawn, and quartered in London 
um, uh, Smithfield, you know, near, near St Bartholomew's Hospital. But Robert the Bruce uh, was a nobleman who had owned estates of both Scotland and England and had been on Edward I's side for a long time, but then he turned against them. And he had a tenuous claim to be King of Scots. But uh, anyway, this, this, this castle here was held by Edward I's men. Of course, you've got to remember there were many Scots on Edward I's side, which some people, Scottish nationalists, prefer to forget. Obviously, and Robert the Bruce was one of them. He was a turncoat. So how on earth was he going to storm this castle? It seemed to be impenetrable, and he had no artillery. Obviously, it wasn't, wasn't artillery with explosives in those days, like trebuchets and things, or battering rams. But one of, one of Robert the Bruce's men had lived in the castle as a teenager, and he knew a way to climb up. The, the, the northern rock face is very, very steep. So he managed to, to, to show the men a way to climb up and they managed to get over the walls and in and, and to storm, storm the castle. The castle was nothing like as big as that back then, uh, the big, big as it is today. And so Robert the Bruce, he ordered the most of the castle be leveled because he, he thought he couldn't hold it. So he wasn't going to allow this military fortification here because Edward the Force, Edward the First could hold it against him. So later on, we'll go and see, um, eventually Robert the Bruce was successful at the Battle of Bur Bannock Burn in 1314, where his army defeated an English army thrice its size. When I say English, obviously there were Welsh on that those side, that side, particularly bowmen. And then Ireland, Ed, Edward I was, was, our, um, was the Lord of Ireland, so there might have been a few Irish on his side too. That's the thing is, Ireland, we've been politically connected to England much longer than Scotland has. Um, anyway, so uh, Scots' um, separate separation from, from England was accepted for quite a long time. And um, although they, they did fight each other, there was the old alliance, Scotland and France, they had a common enemy, England, and by, by being allies, they would oblige the English to divide their forces. The English couldn't send all their army to, 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 to France, had to guard their northern frontier. Um, likewise, the, the English couldn't completely obliterate the Scots because they had to guard their southern coast against, against a French invasion. And there were many attempted French invasions, obviously none of them very successful, but uh, the English always had to take it seriously, building major fortifications along their southern littoral. Um, anyway, um, uh, things were, uh, James I, King of Scots, he was captured by English pirates um, in the early 15th century, and he was taken to England and held there as a captive for many years, and only released for a king's ransom, but he was treated almost as a, almost as a guest for a long time. Um, so one of Scotland's problems is, is, is they would have a king, he would wed, and then his infant would be born, and then while the, 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 the boy was still a baby, the king would die, and there'd be sort of 20 years of a regency, and be sort of a um, uh, playtime for the nobility and, and the uh, bishops, and that they would be ruling, it happened to a sort of regional regency council, and so the state was very feeble. But um, anyway, things got a bit better for, for Scotland under James II when um, England was embroiled in the, wars, in the Hundred Years' War against France, started going very badly. The, the, the Burgundians, that's the eastern area of France, they were on the side of they were on the side of uh, the English for a while, but crucially they changed sides. This is why the French won. Joan of Arc and all that being captured by the Burgundians. But um, there were some Scots troops fighting on the French side in that war, and obviously ultimately the French prevailed. So uh, James II, King of Scots, he received Mons Meg as a gift from the Duke of Burgundy. Um, Mons is a city today in Belgium, but back then Burgundy was semi-independent country, which is most of eastern France, bits of Belgium. Um, anyway, so Mary, Queen of Scots, was, was famously lived here, um, uh, so she was um, born here. Her mother was um, Marie de Guise, uh, or part of the Lorraine, or the Guise family, one of the um, most prominent noble families in, in, in France, distantly related to the, to the royal house. So um, Mary, Queen of Scots, as, as a toddler, had moved to France, grown up there, and had been treated almost as part of the French royal family, and married. Um, to remember who it was France, France the second of France when she was 15 but he died when she was 16 he had an ear infection which turned into an abscess in his brain and then she came back to Scotland at the age of 18 and she was obviously brought up an ardent Catholic her mother had been regent of, 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 of Scotland trying to hold the fort for her daughter um, but um, Scotland was riven by this sort of Reformation controversy um, England had already had its Reformation most of Northern Europe was turning Protestant would Scotland do likewise so there was a Reformation from below not above as in well some of the clergy and the nobility really the, the peasantry they just didn't get a look in they decided it would happen against the wishes of the crown and Mary de Guise was obliged to accept this and then Mary Queen of Scots came back and found that the Church of Scotland had been set up the Catholic Church had been abolished and then again she reluctantly accepted it but many people believe that deep down she didn't and she longed for the day when she could restore Catholicism which she perceived to be true Christianity um, so well and then she, she married again um, um, who, who was it? Um, Henry Stuart, her um, half-first cousin, as in they shared one grandparent, not two. 
She was 21, he was 19, but he was exceptionally immature for his age. So in 1867, here in this, sorry, in 1567, here in this castle, um, she gave birth to her only child, um, James, James VI of, of, of Scots. Um, the the um, numerals are not the same. How would I put it? The, 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 the ordinals, the regnal ordinals are not the same for Scotland and England, but I might come on to that later. So um, uh, she was a passionate Catholic and she had some relics of um, uh, Queen Margaret brought here. The only royal saint in Scotland was Queen Margaret, an Anglo-Saxon princess who fled here after the, the, the Battle of, of, of Hastings in 1066 and married Malcolm Canmore of Macbeth fame. Um, and so she was the mother of David I, King of Scots. So a woman who was exceptional for being so religiously devout, even an extraordinarily religious age. And then she was later buried, I think, in, in, in Dunfermline Abbey. But um, her head was exhumed on the order of Mary, Queen of Scots. Might seem to be an odd thing to do if you want to honor her and place in a golden casket and brought here to be near the queen as she gave birth, thinking this, the, 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 the juju of this holy woman would somehow protected from puerperal fever and such like postpartum complications. Um, so Mary, the Queen of Scots, I won't go into the whole um, saga, but she was overthrown after the chase about raid um, and she married um, uh, um, uh, Bothwell, J uh, James Bothwell, I can't remember his surname actually, bizarrely, um, and he, he did he abduct her, did he um, have consensual intercourse her or did, with her, or did he did he uh, take her by force, it's, it's unclear. But anyway, she was overthrown in um, um, uh, 1567, no, 1567, um, yes, yeah, sorry, her son was born in 1566, and briefly held at Loch Leven Castle, but managed to escape to England, where her, her second cousin once removed, Elizabeth I, was ruling. Which, was she welcomed? Well, the two women actually never met, and held as a, as a, as a guest, but eventually more like a prisoner, and obviously executed um, 20 years later. Um, but anyway, uh, she'd been overthrown, but um, this guy with the surname Kirkcaldy, was it Sir William Kirkcaldy, held the castle for her for five years. So her cause was not given up. There was a possibility she could be restored. And so what, what was going to happen was well, Elizabeth I didn't know what to do with Mary Queen of Scots. Do I, keep, do, I, do I keep her in? Do I let her go? It could be dangerous to do either. She could go back to Scotland, she could regain the throne, or she could be executed or what? Anyway, eventually she was executed in England for plotting against um, Elizabeth I as part of the Babington plot. So Anthony Babington, a Catholic landowner, um, conspired to overthrow and kill Elizabeth I, saying that she was born outside wedlock, had no right to be king. Moreover, she was an Anglican, had persecuted the Catholic Church, executed the Catholic clergy, so she should die. And of course, the, 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 the Pope in Regnans in Excelsis had issued a bull saying that that should happen. Um, so there was a five-year siege um, and the men who were loyal to Mary Queen of Scots were eventually defeated by the cannon smashing down the wall. And uh, so three months after the surrender, that uh, courageous Kakodi, uh, he was executed for his fidelity to the rightful queen as he perceived it. Anyway, coming on to one of the other famous chapters in this castle's history was obviously the 45, 1745, the Jacobite Rebellion. Charles Edward Stuart, um, who was the grandson of um, James II of England, or the same man who's also James VII of Scotland, um, he came back here. He'd been born in Rome and he spoke, spoke um, Italian and French. His, his English was dreadful. Even He couldn't even spell his father's name, James. He spelled James, J-E-M-S and had to communicate with his officers in French. But anyway, he landed at, at um, um, uh, Moidart with only seven men. The much promised um, French help was not forthcoming. Obviously, this was they were embroiled in the War of Austrian Succession against the United Kingdom, and the Hanoverians were ruling George II, whose, whose, whose um, father had come over from Hanover, he was ruling, and crucially, he was a Protestant, whereas Bonnie Prince Charlie was a Catholic. Now, in um, Great Britain, something like 95% of people were, were Protestants. There was a, a few more Catholics in, in Scotland than in England. So it was a Catholic monarch was proposing to rule a Protestant people, just like under Mary Queen of Scots. So the Catholics took his side, but not many Protestants did. So it's surprising he was relatively successful. But most of the British army was fighting in what's now, say, Belgium and Germany and places like that. Germany not being united at the time, which is, but he managed to be fairly successful. I shan't recount his whole, whole military campaign, but he never managed to take this castle. It was held by government troops, held for the Hanoverians. The British army was here. So um, 
Bonnie Prince Charlie is sometimes sort of held up as this hero of Scots nationalism, which is highly misleading. The Act of Union had been passed in 1707, which was quite unpopular, so he vowed to reverse it. But even if he did vow to reverse it, you didn't necessarily want the Jacobites there and saying, well, they want to be absolute monarchs and or I'm against Catholicism. So there was a lot of vicious anti-Catholicism here at the time, which is why him taking over wasn't really, oh, wasn't really viable. But it's so surprising that he was relatively successful for several months. So he didn't manage to take the cast. He had no siege artillery, so it was held against him. So he advanced into England. That was the main prize for him. He wanted to be King of England, King of Scots, King of Ireland. But obviously had to leave a fairly large enemy force in his rear because he um, just was unable to take the castle. Didn't even try, actually. Um, Anyway, so 1707, as I pointed out, um, the, there was the Act of Union. So the Scots Parliament voted to unite with the Parliament of England and Wales. Therefore, the United Kingdom of Great Britain um, was formed. Um, and um, so the, the uh, Scots Crown and um, Scepter and Mace and so on were put into a strong room here, uh, locked up and largely forgotten about. And it's only uh, in the early 19th century, um, uh, Sir Walter Scott, that celebrated novelist and jurist, was pottering about in the vaults in, in Edinburgh Castle when he happened to say, well, where's the key to this? I insist on opening it, and found what they call the Honours of Scotland. Um, and so they became an incredible tourist attraction and people were paying a shilling a time to see them. So this really was a, uh, a barracks, and even to this day, as I say, there are a few soldiers here. During the Napoleonic Wars, um, thousands of French prisoners of war were taken, and sometimes they're brought here um, because thinking, oh well, very far away from France. Um, but the thing is, you've managed to get out of the castle. If you get on a ship going to a neutral country, you'd be, you, you, you'd be, be free. And obviously there's no trade with France, there's no ships with France during wartime. But some of the stonework here was, was, was put there by French prisoners of war. They had to um, build uh, some of the, um, what do you call it, the cobblestone. Of course, as the horses were going around here. So that's why it was very important to have cobblestone. Um, Anyway, there's so much more to tell you, but I'm getting peckish and this video is possibly getting a little bit long. I'm getting into my analytics and seeing what people will or will not watch. But um, this, uh, this place is a bit of an ear airy. It affords the most magnificent vista over Edinburgh. And there's so many things I could point out if I was going to zoom, but I thought I, I'd let, let you have a look at my ugly mug. So we're about to see the governor's house, as in the governor of the castle. In medieval times, we would have said the constable of the castle, as in constable of the castle controls it on behalf of whoever actually owns it because in this case it's the monarch the monarch isn't here most of the time but if you even for a nobleman you might have more than one castle and if you can't be there the constable's got to be there um, obviously that's turned into the surname constable like the celebrated 18th century um, Suffolk painter John Constable, the Constable Country, is that part of Eastern England. Um, so, but if you have the surname Constable, it really means you, that you worked for the Constable. Like these surnames, like King or Bishop or Duke, Earl and Lord and Knight, means you worked for that person, not that you were that person. Um, oh, and I can smell, well, it smells like um, whiskey or something like that. Surely not. Are they drinking on duty? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, um, Queen Margaret's Chapel is the only bit that it dates from the um, 12th century because it was built shortly after she died. It was very small, the royal family used to worship there. So um, then people forgot the purpose of um, Queen Margaret's Chapel and it was simply used as an ammunition dump. And it's only, and um, because the Reformation came along in the 1550s, as I said, and then um, the Church of Scotland did not approve of what they saw as Romish superstition, the veneration of saints, um, which is why they didn't, they didn't use it as a place of worship. And only in the early 19th century did people realize what it was. So then uh, Queen Victoria ordered that it be restored um, as a place of prayer. And so you can go in there and utter your orisons if you wish. Oh yeah, and they're selling whiskey here. Well, you know, whiskey and religion, what a combination. Um, so anyway, it's W-H, I-S-K-Y here, of course in Ireland, we have an E in it because whiskey is the key to everything for us. They're pronounced exactly the same. So, show what I'm talking about. So, hopefully get adverts on YouTube. So, people who produce this, you're gonna give me, give, me, give me some revenue for this? So, we have an E in that in, in Ireland. Um, but obviously, it's derived from Ishkabaha, as in the water of life in Irish. Now, there's, a, there's the Gaelic language, or Scots Gaelic, which is like 95% the same as Irish, just a few spelling and pronunciation differences, or maybe Scots Gaelic's got more English loan words. Um, 
but the two are they're certainly mutually comprehensible but they speak in a more um, sing-song intonation but uh, it's only on the, on, the, on the Western Isles that some people speak it as their daily language about 1% of the population but you'll see quite a few signs up in it trying to, trying to revive a little bit it was never the main language of Scotland because there was Lallans which means like lowlands in Scots because there's Scots is it a language or is it a dialect or what and so for a long time well certainly the, the 19th century the height of unionism it was perceived as simply being bad English but then with the Scottish national movement got going this began to say no it's not even a dialect it's a language and that's that um, so often it's just pronouncing the vowel differently but there are some Scots words which you wouldn't know if you only speak standard English for instance bairn meaning child but that's actually a borrowing from Norwegian so yeah so Mons Meg which I was talking about weighing a few tons pulled by eight oxen and here the cannonballs you wouldn't want those to hit you at hundreds of miles an hour so um, was a formidable Sealy siege gun and was used to um, knock down many stone walls of course these were cannonballs they were not shells they did not explode on impact it was only in the 19th century we managed to have them as shells which were sort of bullet shaped and did explode on impact so um, eventually it was no longer fit for purpose walls were too thick and so on and uh, there were a sort of lighter cannon which are longer range more accurate and packed more of a punch so it's just used as to fire and celebration like I can't remember what is it? it's fired to celebrate was it Mary Queen of Scots marriage and and and, and the shell one well, of the shells or the cannonball went two miles went two miles that away towards where um, the Botanic Garden now is so um, we can go into um, St Margaret's Chapel so yes, obviously the Pope canonized her sometime after she died. I'm not sure why. Were there maybe some miracles on her behalf? By carried out by her. So oh, it was not too dark actually. I thought I might have to put on the extra light. You can hear the acoustics. It's really not very large. Um, oh, and I'll show you the size of the door, which shows you how short people were in ye olden days. And now here is an image of her. And above her, you might see the Anglo-Saxon coat of arms. Those, uh, but I have to. Yeah, make it the martlets, the four birds withdrawn without feet, and that cross, all gold, and then a sort of mid-blue background. The Anglo-Saxon coat of arms is in the coat of arms of University College, Oxford, because according to legend, it was founded by um, Alfred the Great, that we now accept that that legend is bogus, or indeed the coat of arms of Westminster Abbey, again founded by the Anglo-Saxon dynasty, Edward the Confessor. I'm not sure who this chap is here, and his ecclesiastical purple thing with his crozier. So here is a bit of the um, actual chapel bit. And then 1903, it says on the bench, well, it's aged very well. It was made in 1903. Uh, and oh yeah, so here is a copy of the handwritten Bible. It's not the actual one, but just to give you an idea of what it's like with illuminated letters, all in Latin, of course. Um, so illustrated. And then up here, I'm not sure who this um, warrior is. And, is it the three lines of England is fighting against? Wallace, it says, oh yeah. And then it's got below him, ooh, is it too dark? Then below him it's got um, the uh, lion rampant of Scotland with a laurel wreath around it, as in a victor and crown. Okay, so I go out, I'll show you, I'm gonna have to stoop for the door. I may have some sort of idea. Now, I am well above average height, but I'm not a giant. As you can see, you know, even ordinary guys have to stoop. So it gives you some idea how short people were in the old days, you know, that, that, that it was that height. Um, <coughs> so that is the oldest surviving building in the whole of Edinburgh Castle. Uh, anyway, I think that's probably enough for this little bit of the tour because it's just um, uh, just a bit too long. Oh yeah, the dog cemetery, how charming. As a keen onophile, I like to see um, hounds buried with the honor they deserve. I prefer a good dog to an evil human. Well, I prefer most dogs to most humans, I suppose. There you can see the headstones of the pooches. Yeah, we come up from there where those cannons are down there. Princess Street Gardens below. Lots very muddy and walled off because Hogmanay was not so long ago. Hogmanay meaning New Year in Scotland, where they have um, so, so many people, so many revellers walking around on the grass, got very muddy. There's a huge dome with scaffolding there, some public record office. And beyond that, oh, I can see a plane going in towards Edinburgh Airport. And I can see a bit of the fourth rail bridge and some of the road bridge. Well, I shan't really zoom in. And I can see some spires of the Episcopalian Cathedral, three spires. Anyway. It allows you a most a splendid panorama over this fabulous and historic characterful city 
Uh, so down to Princess Street Gardens, some railway lines below, connecting Edinburgh Waverley Station to Edinburgh Haymarket Station. Um, all right, so I'll switch it off for a little bit.